I'm very excited to be speaking with artist and visual noir creator Leslie Peterson Sapp. Her visit is perfectly timed to be available for November. Leslie was born and raised in Portland, Oregon. She attended art school in New York City and graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in 1991. She returned to Oregon and has lived there ever since. She creates narrative paintings and is deeply inspired by the past. For the last several years, she has been focused on making art that is inspired by film noir. Leslie, welcome. I'm glad. To, I'm really excited to be talking to you. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Great. Can you tell us a little bit about your background in art before film noir? Certainly. Um, uh, well, as you said in the intro, I graduated from college in 1991. And um, then after that time, admittedly, I have to say, I just kind of fooled around quite a bit. I tried a lot of different artistic styles and um, just really kind of explored a lot and wasn't very focused. And it was really in, it wasn't until 2009 that I really started to like focus and get serious on having an actual style. And, and the thing that I, I landed on at that time was doing artwork that was based on vintage snapshot. And, um, and that was a really great series to, to do for quite a long time. So I would find vintage snapshots like in uh, a, a secondhand store, or maybe it was something from my family or a friend's family or something like that. And I would create paintings on wood panel. And uh, those were really great and very nostalgic. It's similar to the film noir in the sense that it really is based in the past and is fairly nostalgic. But after a while, it became a little too limiting. And I really wanted to do something that had more imagination and, and more, um, more emotion. And, um, and so after experimenting, you know, taking another couple of years to just experiment with different things, I landed on film noir and really kind of found my home there. Okay. And it's been... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, when you said that uh, paintings, was that like no vacancy or was that in the film noir or the vacancy one? Um, the vacancy one is is the film noir one. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, it is of all the film noir ones I've done, it's the one that is the most similar to the vintage snapshots. In fact, if you go on my website, you'll see it has a little thing that says portfolio and it has a drop down menu and you'll see um, it'll say vintage snapshots because some of these works, I'm not doing them now. But some of them are still available, and so if you wanted to, to, to see what they look like, they're still there. Yes, they're, not, they're really nice. Yeah. Go to the website okay. after you finish watching this video and check them out. I was really interested when you talked about your class with Mark Andrus. In that class, you mm -hmm. used a single film style and a single painter style of your choice to create a new work of art. Can you tell us right. about Lana Turner, Lost in the Land of Beckman? Yeah, I will. Yeah, I'm glad you like this one. So the assignment that I was doing was you had to do it in collage. Um, I couldn't paint it. I had to do it in collage. I had to, to choose a, a single film image and then do it in the style of a painter I like. And Max Beckman is, was a, a German expressionist painter. And uh, his style is just completely and totally his own. And I really admire him, but he's really different than what I do. And I wanted to adopt some of his stuff. And for him, space inside of his paintings is not depicted in a straightforward fashion. It's very distorted. And so rooms sometimes look like they're collapsing or expanding or they're starting to come apart a little bit or rocking like on a ship, if you could imagine. Mm -hmm. And it gives this very disquieting feeling when you're looking at them. And um, so I took the film still from The Bad and the Beautiful with Lana Turner. Now, I know that's not really a film noir, but the film still really is very noir. I mean, right. she's like this world weary woman and she's got a cigarette and, and it's just a really great image. And so I took it and I tried to just sort of like make it more expressive. And, um, and I came up with that <laughs> Lana Turner lost in the land of Max Beckman. And it, it just really hit, like, I was just, that was, I was like, this is it. This is, this sounds really, this feels really great. And so I ran with it ever <laughs> since then. Wow. You really found what you were looking for. That's amazing. Uh -huh. You mentioned in your blog, the term noir has been expanded to not just describe a moment in movie history, but to describe a sensibility that can be infused into any form of expression. I'm personally uh -huh. real interested in Dutch angles or extreme tilts as a technique I use in photography. And I've noticed uh, several of your paintings, there were angles like that that you see in, 
And in film noir, this is often used to make the viewer very uncomfortable. So yeah. what are your thoughts on, uh, you know, I mean, it's a commercial medium, but you're using the angles and somebody might be put off by the angle at the same time. Do you have any thoughts on, you know, using the angles and how far you can tilt or before it becomes too much? Huh, that's really an interesting question. Um, yeah, because because you're right. The, the, the extreme tilts, you know, I mean, they, in, in traditional painting, sometimes they're just used to create a sense of space. Anytime you have a diagonal, it just goes back in space. Um, but when you got that horizontal line kind of tilting a little bit, it really does give you the impression that there's something really wrong with the subject, right? With like the viewer right. or the, the painting. And yeah, I understand what you're saying about the commercial aspect. And do I feel like I'm putting people off by having this display? I don't know the answer to that. I wish okay. I could tell you. Because for me, you know, some people um, don't care if their work is appealing to people at all. And then other people, you know, are extremely commercial and they and they want to only do things that please people. And I'd have to say I'm somewhere in between. Okay. It's like I want people to like my work and I, I want it to be more than just sort of a, you know, insipid sort of, sort of trying to please, you know. So right. having the more, you know, expressive elements are, is really important to me. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, uh, but I, you know what's funny is that for a while there, I was, I'm sorry to interrupt. No. But I'm, for a while there, I was going through this period where I was doing a lot of film noir pieces, but everything was at exact right angles. Okay. Like the one you mentioned, Bloom Room, if you look at it, Everything in there is an absolute right angle. Okay. And and I realized I was doing that too much, and I had to stop. See, I, I know this is not about me today, but I took a film noir photography class out in Santa Fe. And after we went out yeah. and did our first night, me and my, my wife were a team, and we went out and did our first night, and all mine were 45-degree cock. And then we showed them <laughs> to the instructor in the morning. She goes, oh, that's terrible. There's way too much angle. And I said, well, I want to feel like... Uh, Frank Bigelow, when he walks out into the police station in DOA, his whole world's off kilter. So I love right. Dutch angles and big, awesome, uncomfortable angles. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> but have you continued that work? I, I still regularly photograph. Photograph. I've done. Uh, I've done a bit. We we go out and we do night photography and astrophotography. And I I need to get to a bigger town to do some more noir photography. It's kind of hard um. around here. Yeah, because so. it's so rural. Yes. Yeah, there's not places yeah. where, like, masses of people gather. <sighs> Femme fatales have often been villainized for the methods used to obtain their goal. I believe this is the only tool or agency that women have in these cases, in these films, and it's not more sinister than a man beating up or shooting another man. And I know you had some information related to this. Do you have any thoughts on uh, how femme fatales are portrayed? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with you. And I think that the people, I mean, oftentimes they are presented as being like more evil than the, the man. But I think that has to do with like who's writing the films and who's reviewing the films and talking about the films rather than, you know, the actual story. And then, of course, oftentimes um, they'll put a, an, a, an ending on it. And like, I don't know if you've ever heard this quote. I think it was, uh, I'm, I'll bring it up later, The Human Des Desire, which is a great movie with Glenn Ford and Gloria Graham. Yes. And, and it has this kind of, and they did this a lot in old movies. I'm sure, I'm sure you talk about this and that you're aware of this, but oftentimes they, they put something on the end to make it okay with the censors, with the code. Right. With the, with, and so sometimes those endings are just like really strange. Yeah, you're like Glenn and, Ford. Oh, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. no, go ahead. I was saying, look, Glenn Ford, the way he drove away in his train with his girlfriend back, his job back, and no criminal charges or anything. I thought, what just happened? Right. And then, <laughs> and, yeah, and then Gloria Graham's like, actually, I did it all. I wanted the money, and I wanted this, and yeah. I wanted that. And, it's like, and what Eddie Miller on TCM said was, you know, they literally said, blame it on the woman. Like, they had a hard time resolving it with the codes that were necessary, and they just said, blame it on the woman. And so they put this really weird ending on it. Yeah. But the Femme Fatale, there's a great quote that's attributed to Margaret Atwood that says, um, the quote is, men are afraid that women will laugh at them, and women are afraid that men will kill them. I saw that quote. I think you have that on your yeah. site, right? 
Is that on your No, blog? actually, I don't. Oh. I don't. But that maybe I do. I don't know. You find stuff of mine that's kind of interesting. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that, that that's relevant in this case because sometimes the men that are reviewing or making the films really think of it as like being laughed at by one or being made a fool of by a woman is worse than violence. Oh, that's horrible. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So things change, yeah. but they're still interesting, right? Right, right. I don't know. I hope they change. I hope everything's changed. Going on here. I really love the painting Blue Room as it shows three views of the female and a kind of a shadowy one-dimensional male. Now, uh -huh. is it a regular part of your process to dress the part and design the image before you begin painting, or was that something special you did for that one? No, it's really normal. That's really okay. normal. And that's something that a lot of illustrators do, is that they dress up models and they take pictures. And But I don't really have models, and so I will play all the parts. That's fantastic. And dress up in men, men's clothes, uh -huh. you know. And I've had enough experience drawing from the model live to be able to kind of translate myself into a male figure, you know, just broaden the shoulders and, okay. you know, and just that. And, and then I'm able to kind of convert it into a male figure. Oh, fantastic. And, uh, yeah, it is fun. In fact, now what I really do is that I just turn on a video and I just kind of ham it up with the costumes and the lighting. And then I go and I capture film stills from the video afterwards. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's very nice. In your blog, you said that, quote, you consider the masters of film noir your teacher, my teachers, as well as my inspiration, unquote. Would you tell us about your favorite cinematographer, director, writer, or other influencer? Thank you. Okay. The thing about me is that I don't always remember the names, mm -hmm. of, but I can tell you the movies that have been an influence on me. So in other words, I'm not sure if I'm going to be always be able to pull out like the cinematographer uh, of a of a movie, but some of my early uh, influences, like even before I started doing this work, I loved *Raging Bull*. Okay. Uh, which is a wonderful black and white film, and I was just like, "Wow!" You know, I think it's really the thing you love black and white movies was *Raging Bull*. You know, which was done in what 1980 or something. 80. That's a um, yes. Scorsese. Scorsese. Yeah. Scorsese, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very depressing, but, um, though. <laughs> yeah. <it does. laughs> um, I love Out of the Past. And that was done by Nicholas uh, Masurica. That's okay. the cinematographer. That one. But Out of the Past is just, he just what a gorgeous film, that's right? My, that's my shirt here. Oh, wait, yes, it's yes. Because <laughs> that's such a, like, when she walks into that bar and he's been sitting in there, it's just like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. And on that one, I watched the uh, I watched the remake, Against All Odds, with uh, yeah. Jeff Bridges. You know. That's the remake of it. And yeah. I saw that a long time before I ever saw Out of the Past. And when I saw Out of the Past, I just was totally blown away by it. Oh, really? Yeah. You know what's funny? is I don't think I've ever seen Against All Odds. I should, though, because I really like Jeff Bridges a lot. It's and a, Rachel Ward, I like. So yeah. anyway, she's, yeah, I've never seen it. Uh, so out of the past, I love Citizen Kane, Touch of Evil, The Killers. Mm -hmm. That's another really great. I mean, you just look at those shots and you're just like, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, when I was in college, I got to see The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is from 1920. No, it's a German expressionist film. Have you ever seen that one? I know the film, but I've never watched it. I've seen clips of it. You should watch it. It's crazy. It's really cool because it's done completely on these hand-painted sets right. that are unbe not believable, but they're so effective. They work. And it's really fun. Oh, what, besides uh, Beckman, what about in the artist realm? Who are your artistic uh, inspirations? Well, um, yeah. There's a lot. Oh, but, you know, you, you you sent me uh, the Edward Hopper right. uh, film. And, you know, I think that my, the comparisons between me and Edward Hopper is just un, undeniable. So definitely Edward Hopper. And then, so there's Tamara de Lempinka. Do you know her? No, I don't. So Tamara de Lempinka is really, really great. Big was a really great influence on me. Okay, it's very classic. And 
Gauguin. Not so much Van Gogh. They oftentimes they're put together. Van Gogh and Gauguin mm-hmm. are oftentimes compared because they're contemporaries and had certain similarities. But but it's really Gauguin that is really um, my big influence. Okay. Um, and you know, I think that that I'm really influenced by Picasso. Good. But not all of Picasso. One of the things about Picasso is that he um, he had this amazingly wide range of ex- of artistic styles. And so oftentimes when people think of uh, his work, he, uh, they think about the cubism, but he did a lot of etchings that were more like based in classical mythology, which are really amazing. And he uses the Minotaur over and over and over again. And so he's a really great influence on me. And then also Egon Schiele, is a really great influence because he's a great drawer and a draftsman. And um, then your your shirt reminds me of a guy who's a contemporary right now, and his name is Thomas De Anthony. Okay. And it his work looks like your shirt, and it's really it's really fantastic. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I can come up with more. Oh, I'd like to read another clo- quote from your blog, and it says, "Quote: My art is charged with longing, drama, sexual tension, taboos." and covert couplings. Like a private eye snapping a picture through a window, we espy people in places that are not supposed to be or with someone they ought not to be with. You could say I live vicariously through my own art. Unquote. Would you care to expound on that topic? Because that's fascinating to me. (laughs) Well, uh, yeah. um, I think it's true with a lot of things where, you know, like I, you know, for a lot of people, let's just say, for example, it's cathartic. You know, it's cathartic. You know, that's part of what, you know, art does for people, art of all forms, is that, you know, so maybe somebody likes to watch more war films, right? But they don't want to go into combat, right? Or maybe they like punk rock, but they, you know, like live a middle class life or, you know, that kind of thing. And I just think that part of my attraction to film noir is the kind of over the top drama that can Mm -hmm. happen in them. And the ways in which people um, are, they, if they're not clever, they think they're clever. Mm-hmm. And they're trying to manipulate things to their advantage. And so part of what's really fun about watching it is like, are they going to succeed or not in their plot? Right. And, but in my real life, it's like, I do not do that at all. Oh. I'm like, I've, I've done a really good job of, of like, I mean, I think that when I like everybody when they're younger they kind of go through their drama yeah but i've done a good job of kind of making my life like very sort of simple and straightforward and i hang out with people who are very trustworthy and well-meaning and so i I tend to live a life of great positivity but i have this kind of macabre and sensibility right and you know and i'm sure that's Something that a lot of people get out of film noir, right? Right. I, I didn't mean to imply that you were on the uh, most wanted list or anything out there. <laughs> I, was, I, I was talking, to, you know, you know, metaphorically anyway. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So it is. It does feed something, and you know, I like it. Like, cause there's always somebody smarter, more or slipperier than yourself when you think you're at the top and you can beat everybody. There's very few that can really do that. Yeah, well, and also f- to what end? I mean, usually when you're when you're doing things that are manipulative and not straightforward, you think that you're winning something, but oftentimes in the end, because what we really want, of course, is to be, you know, safe and to be loved and, mm-hmm. you know, to be, you know, recognized and appreciated. And you're not going to get that if you're lying and cheating to people, <laughs> you know. Um, but, you know, oftentimes it feels like you're going to win. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, I know exactly what you're saying. Yes, absolutely. You know, because I love film noir, I try to watch in one a day if I can find them. You know, so <laughs> I do, but I'm, you know, but my idea of a good time is going in the backyard and cutting the grass. <laughs> okay. well, that's great. Uh, this is the first time I've heard Shakespeare reference with film noir. You wrote, why is Shakespeare still so popular after all this time? It is because its stories and characters are timeless. Could you expand on that a little bit? I mean, uh, do you see, do you see uh, is Shylock uh, a character out of Shakespeare that might turn up in film noir or something like that? 
Well, I think uh, the noirist of Shakespeare is Macbeth. Okay. That's about as noir as it gets. You know, the plot and the fact that it all comes collapsing down around them. And do you, are you? I mean, I'm yeah, just making was... this. Like, there's been some really good movie adaptations of Macbeth too. But you know, so so they kill like they basically they're super uh, usurpers. They're, they're usurpers, and they had like a plot. And I just think it's great. You know, that's very noir. Yeah. And the fact that it it doesn't work. Like they achieve some of their goals, but then they collapse. It, you know, America. and go into madness and all this stuff, right? It's very uh, film noir, film fatal, because they blame it all on the woman it, for, uh, you know, for pushing him into killing the king. That's true. Yeah. Huh. But what I'm referring to directly when I'm talking about, about that part it really, really has to do with the, the fact that the characters and the, and the stories are so good with Shakespeare and so solid. And nowadays, you know, people do adaptations they put them in modern dress mm -hmm. you know or they you know and that happens a lot you know they put them in different situations you know like maybe into war, war europe or something like that but the story is so solid and the characters are so good it translates it doesn't it doesn't come across as being dated or right. awkward yeah and so that's sort of what i mean and i'm not really talking about an individual film because of course with film noir the quality of the films they vary widely. Sure. I mean, there are some real characters out there, you know, but the character, the stock characters and the sort of general plot mechanisms are so solid that you can translate them into all kinds of um, exterior. You know, you can change the genders of the people, you can change the time and things like that. And it can still like have a noir sensibility. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I'm wondering if anybody's adapted. I just watched the Michael Fassbender Macbeth the other night from 2015, and yeah. it's amazing. But I I wonder if anybody's actually taken that and put it into a film noir, and just run it as a film noir. Yeah, yeah, be... I wonder too. So, did, did you ever see a movie called Brick? Brick, I don't think so. Okay, Brick. Um, I saw it a long time ago, but it's a really good movie because what it is is that it's a film noir that is set in a high school. Okay. And it and, and it's very funny um, because it's it's played completely straight. Like they talk noir talk, and they and it's a noir like plot line. And there's okay. like Mr. Big who just graduated last year, still living at his mom's house. I mean, it's very funny, but it is done really really well. And I would recommend it. Brick is a good one. Okay, I'll have to look that one up. That sounds interesting. Uh, obviously, you watch film noir. I asked Alan K. Rohde this, and he wouldn't tell me what his favorite movie was, but do you have a favorite film noir, a uh, femme fatale, or a homme fatale? And for reference, mine yeah. is Born to Kill. I love that. Yeah, you tell me. Yeah, yours is. Oh, yours B is. Born to Kill, 1947, with Claire Trevor and Lawrence Tierney. They're so bad. <laughs> They're both so bad. <laughs> yeah, you got like the, the homme fatale and the femme fatale like wrapped up in the same movie. Yeah. And the fact that they're they're kind of going at each other and they're stuck and they're conspiring together at the same time. They're like animals, you yeah. know, and it's hey. They're really, they really <laughs> are tough. Yes. Well, so uh, do you have any favorites that you'd like to throw out? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, my favorite movie probably of all time actually is Vertigo. And, you know, some people say Vertigo is not really a film noir, which is, you know, fine. Eddie Muller says it's a film noir. So I'm willing to take his word for it. But at least it's noir adjacent. Like, it's very noir-esque. But that is my favorite movie. Yeah, that's a good um, movie. Yeah, yeah. There's something about the longing and the kind of unrequited. I mean, because it's not unrequited. It's unrequited love, but really what it is is an unrequited dream. Like, both of them have a dream of what they think love is. And they and they almost touch it, but they can't. And then there's a crime element. And it's really great. But that's my probably my favorite um, fi um, film. But my favorite Om Fatale is, without a question, uh, Joseph Cotton in, um, in Shadow of a Doubt. Okay. Have you ever seen that one? Uh, you know, I've watched part of it, but I haven't actually finished it. But it just yeah. came back up again because I was looking at some October stuff and the Dr. X, the return of Dr. X. And 
he was his character was based on one of the serial killers who was running around at the time. Mm. Am I thinking of the right movie? Maybe. It's so yeah. Dr. X, isn't that an earlier film? Yeah, that was much earlier. And then Humphrey Bogart was in The Return of Dr. X. And they mentioned it. Right. I was reading in IMDb and they said that, uh, I think I believe Joseph Cotton in uh, Shadow of a Doubt was based on one of the killers. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. But it, yeah. In this movie. And it's funny because I saw this movie a long time ago before I really knew about, uh, uh, before I'd ever seen a lot of old movies. And, um, and so I always thought of Joseph Cotton as like this really like sexy leading man who was like so bad and, yeah. and you know, lured women into, into terrible situations. And then I see him for some and I realized that he, that was an unusual role mm -hmm. for him. You know, he was a versatile actor, but you know, oftentimes he played like the kind of like nice guy. Yeah. Right. Right. He was, you know. Yeah. He was uh, a pretty regular, like in uh, Citizen Kane, you mentioned earlier, and uh, The Third Man, right. I believe he was. Third Man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a decent guy. Yeah, just a very decent person right. in this movie. He's bad, 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 <laughs> in yeah. the best way. He's great. And then my favorite femme fatale is probably Gloria Graham in Human Desire. She's so good. She was so good. And just such, yeah. I watched that. The one where she died, I forgot what it's called. The uh, film stars don't die in Liverpool. You know, I have not seen that. Oh, watch it, but it's sad. I mean, uh, the actress uh, does such a good job. Annette yeah, Annette Benny. Annette. She does such a great job in that film, and it's just gut wrenching, but Is good. It? Yes. Yeah, I should watch that. I, yeah, that that's a good one. But I think that part of the reason why I like the her role as the femme fatale in Human Desire is because. She's both a perpetrator and a victim at the same time. You know, and I really identified with her in a way like when her husband is like leaning on her to go talk to this guy to get his job back. And she says, you know, I'd rather not. Right. And at that moment, she says, I'd rather not. You know that something happened mm -hmm. in her past, you know, with this guy where she'd been victimized or something like that. But her husband just pushing yeah. her. Yeah. And then she turns around and then she uses her, her same feminine wiles to try and get Glenn Ford's character to, to kill her husband, you know? Yeah. And it, so she, she's, she's a victim and she's a perpetrator at the same time. That's a real And good. I think that's, yeah, that's, that's what's really <laughs> fascinating about the character there, yeah. Oh, awesome. Uh, you mentioned on your site that you'd become interested in, in art related to archaeology and talked about the book and the movie of The Dig 2021. Can you comment on that for us and where you're going in that direction? Uh, do you want me to talk about the film or the book or the, or the art? Or uh, which one? The Where you're going with your art, I, if it would be best. You know, what, what interests you about archaeology and why are you drawn to that? And, uh, you know, the, the secret that us professional archaeologists know that some days it's just ditch digging, <laughs> moving wheelbarrows full of dirt up hills and stuff like that. <laughs> they don't paint that, though. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine, man. I just look at people, uh, in, uh, like, you know, on my archaeology shows or whatever, and I just imagine what their backs and their shoulders must feel like. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, oh, my God. Well, I, um, I'm, I think it's so fascinating that you're, that you're an archaeologist yes. um, and a film noir buff at the same time. I'm just like I threw that out there on my blog post uh, a year ago or something like that. And then you found it and you were like, I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> but um, so basically, I have to say, honestly, I have never been on a dig ever. Right. Um, and so my fascination has because of over the years, I've just gotten more and more and more. I just I consume like books, magazines, and, and shows about archaeology. And I, and I just keep finding it fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. And so I started to think, well, you know, not, this is something that I should uh, be, you know, trying to expect, you know, because it's sustained. You know, it hasn't been like, oh, yeah, I was into that for a little while, and now I've moved on to something else. It's like, this has been going on for over a decade where I've gotten more and more and more <laughs> interested in it. And um, so... I don't really know because it's just, it's right at the, the very beginning. I'm looking over here because I'm looking at this little pile of, uh -huh. of materials that I've just started to play with. 
Okay. Um, you know, and so I think that there's something about having something emerge out of the dirt that is so fascinating to me. And then there's something about just history and the quest to be able to learn something about ourselves by things that you that you can't know because history is cool when you read right you know about what people have written but there's something so wonderful about it's almost like communicating with a ghost <laughs> in a way you know what i mean yeah, I do. because it's not written you have to find out and so i'm trying to figure out how am i going to and so i'm sort of thinking about layers of things of like semi-transparent layers where you can see different things through the layers on a flat. So it'll be flat, but sort of like different layers. That's what I'm thinking about. That's, I'm still experimenting. That's very interesting. Uh, I sent you the two pictures, but there's another one where, where it's got archaeologists at the top of the ground and below yeah. the, or below the ground and around them are, you know, colonial soldiers and, there's an Indian woman in basically under the ground offering a pot up to the archaeologist. And wow. Yeah, I'll try to find that one and send it out too. But it, it's is kind it the of same artist. It is the same artist. He had a contract and they uh, used him, him almost exclusively. But yeah, and and so sometimes people see it and they they understand. Oh, this is all the stuff that's in there, and they're like, other people see it and go, why is that woman handing that pot up? You know, but <laughs> she's obviously. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll find a picture of that and send it to you because it, it's kind of showing um, the multi layers. I'm I'm curious. Why did you decide to become an archaeologist? My mother drug me to mound sites and places like that all my life, and and just was fascinated by the culture. And then I started as a business major, and uh, I was taking an anthropology elective, and I was making C's in business and A's in anthropology and i took it as a sign and uh right ended up working you know started i went on a volunteer dig for like a week and that's it you know took off and uh <laughs> the 37 years worth of it that's amazing yeah. that's really cool yeah there's some digs around here um uh that i know that if i if I wanted to focus on it i can become a volunteer and get trained and things like mm -hmm. that and it's something i'm considering but um, right now, I'm just trying to scrape together enough hours to be an artist. And Understood. Uh, absolutely yeah. understood. You know, uh, yeah. what you said earlier, we were excavating in St. Augustine at the, the fort there, the Spanish fort in St. Augustine, Florida. And we got down to a uh, coquina floor, which is a kind of stone that grows around there. And we were cleaning yeah. it. And the guy that was with me goes, you know, we're the first part people to touch this in 300 years. And I was like, mm, that's pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. 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 That's just fascinating. I think that um, just, yeah, there's something about learning about us as people by what we've learned and, and uh, you know, by what we leave in the ground. And I'm fascinated by that. I'm just fascinated by the whole process. Yeah. The, the deterioration, not just, you know, like this thing was built. But also how how it deteriorates when it's in the ground, or you have a structure, and the fact you know, and, and then archaeologists are able to figure out like, was it burned? Did it collapse? Mm -hmm. Was it you know recycled? Was it dismantled and used? Was the stones used in a different structure? And where is that structure? And so it's that's almost like it's almost like a mystery novel. It is kind of a detective a thing. Uh, I did did I tell you that I am writing my first archaeological mystery? It's, I was about to ask you about that. Yeah. How's that going? It went down to the editor last week, and then uh, they lost power down in South Florida, so I don't know when I'm going to get get it back from her. But hopefully uh, six months to a year, it'll be ready. You know, and I, t I get uh, the archaeological, uh, archaeology magazine from the uh, American mm -hmm. Institute of Archaeology. And, you know, I'm sure you've seen that in the back, oftentimes I do see people with little advertisements for their for their um, novels, archaeology mystery novels. I mean, that's a thing. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah. Yeah, have you seen those? Have you, kept, have you, have you seen them? I, the little ads? I have not seen the ads. I've seen the magazines, but I didn't notice the ads, you know, and now I have to look yeah. that up. That's great. Yeah, it's a thing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, my last question, and I got this from Rachel Maddow, but uh, what did I forget to ask you? 
<laughs> she's great. Um, she's a great interviewer, isn't she? And uh, what did I forget? Was there anything else that I forgot to ask you, though, that you wanted to throw in? No, I think your questions have been great. I oh, appreciate it. Okay, would you please tell the audience where they can find your artwork and any social media channels you want them to follow you on or anything? Yes, yes, that'd be great. Um, so my website is very simple. It's lesliepetersonsap.com. And so that's easy. And at the on that site, you will find little icons where you can link up to my social media sites. And they are different names, but they always have Leslie Peterson Sap. So okay. with, with Instagram, it's Leslie underscore Peterson underscore Sap. On Facebook, it's Leslie Peterson Sap Fine Art. And I'm on Twitter at Peterson Sap. Okay. Fantastic. Well, look, I really appreciate you coming. That was a lot of good information. I think everybody's going to get a lot out of this. And, it, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to see where you go from here. I really appreciate you coming. Thank you so much for asking me, and uh, I've had a great time. Well, thank you.